Hello and welcome back. Um, somebody said in the comments a couple of weeks ago, would I explain where all the various bits go? Because it is it is a little out of context. We've got an A pillar here and a bit of honeycomb there and none of it makes any sense, I get that. So in this film, I'm gonna show you exactly how the RS200 chassis is put together. But there's a little story goes with it because it's a, a bit of a conglomeration of steel and honeycomb aluminium. And the story goes, as told me by Bob, and if you don't know who Bob is, I'll put a link, I'm not sure, don't know which side, that side I think, um, that explains exactly who Bob was. Lovely fella. And Bob told me that Ford invited legendary F1 and sports car designer Tony Southgate to propose a design for their new rally car. So that's exactly what Mr. Southgate did. Now I spoke to Tony Southgate a few weeks ago and asked if I could interview him for this channel. And he said yes, when he gets a little space in his diary. So hopefully I'm gonna put that together in the new year, which will be good. But Tony submitted a design for Ford's new rally car. And he did it in the way that he knew. So there's a lot of lightweight structure right at the front, the engine and gearbox were stressed parts of the chassis, just like a Formula One car. And Ford's rally people took one look at this and went, no, 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 you can't do that. Because if you knock a corner off this car in a rally, you can't stick a new one on and keep going. To which Tony replied, so the story goes, well, if you knock a corner off your car, your race is finished anyway. So what difference does it make? But the Ford rally people said, no, no, what you do is we need to be able to heat it up and bash it with a hammer and weld and cut and bodge and fettle and get a new corner on the car and get it moving again because you never know when your competitor is gonna do even worse damage and knock two corners off their car, and you can still win with a damaged car as long as you're still in the rally. The other thing was, they said, you've designed a car where you work on everything from above. That's not how you work on rally cars. You have to do it all from underneath. So Tony went back to his drawing board and he submitted a second design, which is the one that you see here which is a, a mixture of steel at either end, so you can cut it, shut it, weld it, bodge it, and retaining the honeycomb in the middle, which for the crash bang wallet world of rally or rally cross is a little unfortunate because you've got a really stiff bit at one end and a really stiff bit at the other end and a relatively squidgy bit in the middle. And this is where chassis number 68 has suffered. So I'll show you the, the diagram of how the, the drawing of how the, the chassis is put together and show you which bits are what. Now this is the drawing that Ford supplies with the owner's manual, a chassis drawing, which I always thought was a slightly unusual thing to include in an owner's manual, but bearing in mind what the cars were meant to do and how they're meant to do it, you'd probably need this. And I've just added a bit of color so you can differentiate the different materials. So I'll take you through this and then show you a few pictures of how it all goes, take you around the car, and hopefully by the end of it, um, you'll have a proper understanding of how the car's built. Please, if there's any more, as ever, put it in the comments. I'd love to know what everybody thinks and if I've done this properly. And also, please hit the like thing and subscribe. Then I know if people are liking this or not. So I'll take you through this. See you at the other end, as usual. This is the chassis drawing in plan form. And I've put a bit of colour on it so you can pick out the different materials. Everything in blue is steel. Everything in what I said was yellow, but Emily insists, is peach, is honeycomb aluminium. The red is composite, that's carbon Kevlar matte. And the green is the engine mounts and it's cast magnesium. I just thought green would pick it out. So at the front, you have two chassis legs and they pick up the front suspension points, the wishbones. There's a frame out the front that carries the bodywork, the water radiator and an oil cooler for the gearbox. Here is the front chassis with the wishbones on and the space frame. Upper wishbone picks up at these two points. Lower wishbone picks up at these two points. The what was always called the shocker frame comes up also from this suspension point up to there. The dampers are spanned between the end of the upper wishbone and the shocker frame. And there's also a brace down to the front suspension point. The A pillars, the things we've been trying to get right, go from there round to here and include that triangular structure. These parts 
were really badly damaged. The front extension, this piece, was fairly badly damaged and corroded. But what we want is to get all of this structure, the right shape and nice and strong, so it can use its strength while we repair the peach coloured honeycomb. This is, it says on the drawing, this is a left hand drive car and that is the hole where the pedal box goes through. But on the production cars there was also one over here because the theory was you could convert at any time from left hand drive to right hand drive. It wasn't really as simple as that. But there should be another cutout on that side. It shows how early the drawing is. This here is where the steering column is mounted and it's a fabricated steel item that slots on with a few bolts and that will come off and go on this side. And this was part of the thing with left hand drive or right hand drive. This actually ended up having to be offset so you need a opposite handed one if you're going to convert your car. These are the jacking points and they would later be extended outwards so you could put the car on stands. These parts here are it's the aftmost mount for the gearbox. Now the gearbox spans the transmission tunnel. This is the transmission tunnel. And the gearbox lives in this region and it has a bracket at the front to support it which spans there. And these two steel sections which also form attachment angles with the floor have the pickup points for the aftmost gearbox pickup points. This is the gearbox. This is what I was saying about where it spans the transmission tunnel. There's a bracket at the back which picks up on those steel attachment angles either side of the tunnel and a bracket at the front which attaches to the front suspension pickup points, the lower aft ones. Drive shafts come out of here. Drive for the rear wheel comes out of here. This is the gear shift mechanism on the top. These are where you bolt your seat down. They're inserts in the floor from behind. Then we come to a steel cross member that runs all the way through the car from one side to the other and also has mounts for the bell housing. The bell housing goes here, the engine fits in this space and it runs to, the drive runs to a transfer box here which changes the direction of rotation and also allows for changing the overall gearing of the car. It's just two gears in there. From there a shaft runs forward to the gearbox. The gearbox has two drive shafts out of the front wheels Another shaft comes all the way back past everything and the rear diff lives in this hole. And the back is all steel. So the steel can be cut and shut, welded and bodged, fettled and whatever else was required by Ford's rally people. All the rear suspension builds away from this steel section. The complete rear space frame. There's the steel extension in the bottom. Everything's built away from there. This frame here mounts the tops of the dampers, tops of the struts, upper lower wishbones. This then ties up to the roll cage at the top and down to effectively into the jacking point in that corner. That's the air cleaner. Intercoolers at the top, above the, the bulkhead, or on, above the window in the bulkhead I should say. There's the dry sump tank. The rear diff lives in here and this provides for carrying a full-size spare wheel and there's provision at either end of the car so you could carry two spare wheels if you wanted or you could use a spare wheel as ballast and again in side elevation that's the frame that holds the radiator oil cooler and front body work front chassis legs now that hole there is to allow a water hose to pass through because the chassis rails are narrower than the radiator so the cooling hose comes through there. This bracket's for the front anti-roll bar. That hole there is to allow the steering rack to pass through. And this is the A pillar. That's where the door hinges bolt on. This is the A pillar that we've been working on so hard. That's the jacking point. This is the attachment angles that pick up the gearbox mounts. Again transmission tunnel is in red. Everything in peach, Emily, is honeycomb. That's the cross member that runs all the way through. And this is the main hoop of the roll cage. Here is a, a bare tub. Now I think this was taken at Tickford when 139 was repaired after it was stolen and crash damaged. That was before my time. But this is a complete bare tub. This 
rear bulkhead has the fuel cells inside of it. They're aluminium tanks and they load inside this bulkhead from beneath. These are the fuel tanks. On the left hand side of the car is a small one and this includes the fuel level sender, the filling point and various tappings. There's a flow and return there and there's a baffle inside to ensure that this sender performs properly which has another story attached to it that I'll tell some other time. This tank is the one from the right hand side of the car and it's been modified, it's had a part let into it and there's a short length of braided hose with a non-return valve on it because the original non-return valve was so terrible uh, it was found to be um, sucked inside out and was very likely where the fire started that damaged 139 so that was upgraded and modified and proper kit installed the roll cage bolts onto these holes here and the hoop goes up and over the top and it also bolts into the air pillar so the roll cage goes up and across the top and down into the air pillar so when you went to Ford way back when to buy a new tub for your crunched RS200 that's the piece you came away with the roof coming off 139's damaged chassis now you can see the old tub still has the roll cage fitted and these two helpful chaps are lifting the fiberglass roof section off and this is the roof section it comes off in one it includes these parts here which if you recall from the other air pillar where it had been chiseled away that's the piece of fiberglass that had been taken out with a chisel so it includes the roof there's a rear bulkhead windscreen opening, door openings and it rivets along the sills and bolts and rivets into the A pillars and that's what keeps the weather off. This is the roll cage that lifts off the top of the tub and bolts in, bolts out. So that goes on first and then this goes over the top. Another jacking point, engine mount and the rear steel extension from which the rear suspension built. So that is the RS200 tub that's the bit that we're working on at the moment that's how the chassis goes together well i hope that walkthrough of rs200 anatomy was interesting i hope it was informative i hope it gives a better understanding of what we're working with downstairs i really should have done that first but you know not a very good youtuber so it all got done in a haphazard scattergun sort of way so hopefully that's sorted now so now we'll crack on and, and keep fixing the car thanks for watching